part two on emotional Christians, 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4, uh, and 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 10. Um, Paul says, well, though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle had made you sorry, though it were before season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrow to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive uh, damage by us and nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to repent of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Scripture teaching may at times rebuke people and lead them to sorrow for sin. This may not be enjoyable or unpleasing to the people, but it is still an essential part of the work of the ministry. Excuse me. When we assemble with our brothers and sisters in Christ, um, Acts 20 and 7. I don't know if my can pull it up yet, but it might not have. Okay, look like it's ready to go now. Acts 20 and 7 says, And upon the first day of the week when the disciples came, they break Paul preached and them, ready to depart on the morrow and continue his speech unto midnight. Um, the word of God. 1 Corinthians 4, Paul talked about that in 19 through 26. And then in 1 Thessalonians, um, now I get that scripture. I just want to give a few scriptures, but I'm giving you some scripture that you can go back and uh, you can do some studying for yourself. 1 Thessalonians 2 and 4, Paul said, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God, which tries our hearts. Um, so not pleasing men. I can talk about that. I have a testimony on that. That was my life. A uh, long time. want to please man. Um, worship based on human invention is vain. Look at what Jesus said in the earthly ministry to the nation of Matthew 59, 15 and 9. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine, uh, the commandments of men. We must avoid things uh, that people invent or choose to participate in, either because of human wisdom or because of human feelings. Colossians 3, 17, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Everything we do must be in Jesus' name by his authority. We are separated from God if we participate in any practice that cannot be found in God's word, right, divided. Paul put down a scripture in Galatians, uh, Galatians 1. See what Paul says. 8 through 9. But though we are angels from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, that which ye also preach unto you, let him be accursed. And as we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you that ye have received, let him be accursed, is what Paul said. Um, so my brothers and sisters, so we should not design, uh, when you come to these assemblies, whatever they call worship, or choose to participate in those things, simply or primary because they give people a certain feeling or emotion. We must determine what we practice or participate in holy on the basis of what God's word says to do right divided. I remember I was uh, doing my sister's eulogy and uh, uh, they got to playing that bumping music that get folks in that Pentecost that get you jumping, jumping. You know, and uh, I just stayed the course uh, because all those folks was, it was catering to the flesh. Uh, I just stayed the course uh, and went on uh, and I got on up and, and I hear up and got to the mic so I can go on. And uh, as I was uh, in charge of the program also. But so, yeah, uh, I didn't get I didn't get all out of sort because of the music got to going. But, you know, you st I stayed course and what God would have me to do. Um, so we must determine what we practice, participate, and hold it on the basis of what God's word says to do right divided. Now, when Christians um, 
assembled together around the word of God, they surely often experience emotion. This is good. But again, the point is that we must control our emotions, not let them control our decisions about what we do. All people have emotions. People have highs and lows. Some go way high and then way low. Others vary relatively little. But everyone has times when we are emotionally up in time, we are down or blue. If the purpose or success of worship were to be measured by emotions, there would be no standard for how we to worship or, you know, when we come together and uh, simmer around the word of God or what we call worship and what constitutes acceptable uh, worship when we together because it would vary so much. So the standard God is said is the absolute one, not determined by emotion. We must choose to do what God says do, motivated by devotion and trust in his word, right? Divided, regardless of what our emotions would encourage us to do. As we obey God in his way, we will develop a true and abiding sense of joy, not based on natural thrills or artificial excitement, but based on our convictions that we have pleased God according to his will. This is true spirituality. Um, do we convey a message that we mean and, and people can understand? When emotions are the emphasis, many things may be done that excite and thrill regardless of whether or not they are reasonable or easily understood. For example, instruments, clapping, shouting, strong music rhythm, aroused feeling, but convey no understandable message. Anytime I remember when I was used to be hooping, all that, all that squalling and everything, I haven't said a word. But folks just jumping and shouting. Wasn't nothing there to understand. Uh, continued repetition of amen and praise the Lord may lead to excitement with no thought of the meaning of the expression. Some preachers preach with a sing song, hypnotic rhythm. I call hooping. I know I used to cater to the flesh and please men by hooping. This is often interpreted by an interjection from the audience to produce excitement and the audience be pushing you on. They love that that what they call hooping. Excitement with little emphasis on the word of truth, right divide. You ask those folks, once the preacher's preaching done, hooping at night and catering to the flesh, what uh, they say, he showed preaching. You ask what he preach about. They say, I don't know, but he showed preach. All they was thinking about and caught up in was emotions. Consider these passages for our learning. Jesus, his earthly ministry to the nation of Israel, talking with the Pharisees and scribes about their traditions and commandments of men. Jesus said in Mark 7, 14, and when he had called all the people unto him, he said to them, hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. Ephesians 5, 17, wherefore be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The intent of our teaching should be to convey a message that people can understand. Colossians 1, 9, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Ephesians 3, 3 to 5, how that by revelation he made unknown to me a mystery, as I wrote a in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages were not made known unto the sons of man, is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Look at what Nehemiah 8 says. So they read in the book, in the law of God distinctly and gave a sense and caused them to understand the reading. The Levites taught Israel by reading God's law and then giving the sense so as to cause people to understand. Acts 17, 2. As Paul, and Paul, as his manner was in to them, went in to unto them, and three savage days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Acts 18, 4, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Acts 18, 19, he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. The scriptures, my brothers and sisters, that's what he used. Now, 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, this chapter discusses particular spiritual gifts in the age when they existed. Prior to the completion of the scriptures, that which is perfect. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13. Charity never fell it, but whether there be prophecy, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Song, tongues have ceased, if you don't know that. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, 
I spake as a child, understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For we now see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part. But then shall I know even also I am known. And now by the faith, hope, charity, and these three. But the greatest of these is charity. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scriptures given by the inspiration of God. And it's proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfectly third furnished unto all good works. <clears throat> However, the principle discussed would apply to all things done in worship assemblies. Paul says, let all things, look at 1 Corinthians 14, 20, see, how is it then, brother, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm, has a doctrine, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. 1 Corinthians 14, 4, let all things be done decently and in order. All is to be done for the purpose of edifying by means of conveying and understanding understandable messages when you come together. 1 Corinthians 14, 6. Now, brother, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophecy or by doctrine? 1 Corinthians 14, 9. So likewise, ye accept ye other by the tongue where it is understood, to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? For you shall speak into the air. 1 Corinthians 14, 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous, of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. And look, what we should be, what we should be conveying should be understandable, my brothers and sisters. And let's move on down. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 14, 15 to 17. What is it then? I would pray with the spirit. And look what he says. I would pray with understanding also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with understanding also. Else when thou shalt be blessed with the spirit, how shall he that occupied the room of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks, seeing and understanding not what thou said? For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. Unbelievers would not be persuaded and converted unless they hear a message they can understand. So if they come into assembly and all they see is jumping around and then and then all they see is emotional highs, hooping and nothing has really been said and conveyed, the message of salvation, they don't hear the gospel of their salvation, they will not be persuaded. So when we come together, it must be decent and in order. Much of what is done is confusing. At best, or even completely incapable of being understood when you go to some of these assemblies. And uh, even in the body of Christ as a whole, what we, what we see a lot in the day is a lot of confusion. My brothers and sisters, when, we, when they emphasize emotions, people depart from proper concern for an understandable message. Like I said, most of what, much of what is done is confusing at best or either, even completely incapable of being understood. The emphasis is on feelings, not on reason and understanding. This is clearly rebuked in 1 Corinthians 14. Now, you could just Specifically consider a phrase like praise the Lord and amen. Surely such expressions have a proper place in Christian vocabulary, but consider what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 7. Jesus taught his disciples to not use vain repetitions. Vain repetitions refer to repeating words or phrases without seriously considering the meaning, my brothers and sisters. Uh, we are just... We are just mouthing words in their desire to stir up emotions. Some preachers and audience repeat amen and praise the Lord so often they become vain repetitions. I've heard audience amen a preacher so much that they said, they said it even when he made completely meaningless statements. One preacher got caught, got tangled up in the microphone cord 
So he made some insignificant comments about the court and several people said, amen. I have talked with charismatic Kerm, 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 <coughs> folks who use the phrase, praise the Lord. Charismatic folks that use the phrase, praise the Lord for everything. We would discuss a practice they participated in and I would give a scripture to show why I believe they were wrong even when they could not answer, explain their practice in harmony with the passage. They said, oh, well, praise the Lord. That's what folks, this stuff they didn't practice over the years, years, and that's all that's in them. There's nothing else on the inside. Uh, surely these expressions have lost their true meaning to these people. They are vain repetitions. Amen. So be it. It's used in scripture at the end of prayer. Paul used in 14, 1 Corinthians 14, 16. Else when thou blessed with the spirit, how shall he that occupied the room of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks? Seeing he understand not what thou said or at the end of the book of, or sermons, they use it. Romans 16 to 27. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and communion of the Holy Ghost will be with you all. Amen. Now, it is sometimes used when there is a logical break in thought in a lesson. Romans 1.25, excuse me, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Romans 11.36, for of him and through him and to him are, are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. But never in the Bible is amen used in a way that repeatedly interrupts the train of thought. What are you amening to? But never, like I said in the Bible, is used in ways that repeatedly interrupt the train of thought, even in the middle of sentences. I can stand up and preach going to some of these similes. I can stand up and say, you know what? My wife and I went out to dinner and we had a great dinner. Amen. And folks say, Amen. Vain. Repetition. What's on the inside? Uh, such a practice in the ability of the speaker to reason with the audience and continue use of the word cause to lose its significance and become a vain repetition. The word Amen is used less than 80 times in the whole Bible. That amounts to about one occurrence in every 20 pages. Yet some preachers in Austin use it that often in 10 minutes of a sermon. So the conclusion, we have learned in this study that we should avoid, we should avoid the abuse of emotions. At the same time, we should not overreact by concluding that all experience of expression of emotion is bad and should be suppressed. The truth is that emotion can be good, but only when we are in control so that we are doing what is scriptural, understandable, and edifying in the dispensation of grace. Yes. Some some songs. When you when you're listening to them and you listen to the words. Yes, feels good when you know what God's word is saying in song. Huh? And what he has done. Yes. But I'm not I don't let emotions, don't overreact. Let them carry you away. Uh, it is only good and natural for Christians to feel and express emotions as they serve God. But we will not let emotions determine for us what we will believe or what we will do when we come around the word of God. Nor may we let them hinder people from understanding the meaning of what is done when we come around the word of God together. What is the basis for your beliefs and your practices when you assemble around the word of God or you having time in the word of God? What is your basis? Is it emotions or is it the word of God? Most of the time, like I say, many of these folks, that's all they have. Emotions, they thrive on emotions. 
And if you look on the inside, if you can see on the inside, for doctrine, there is no doctrine. So we pray that, that they get that desire, have a desire to get in God's word and study it and get doctrine on the inside and not be led by emotions. God don't know, God do not speak to us through emotions. He speaks to us through his word. Yes, his word. So we thank God for, for this lesson. Uh, emotional Christians, uh, you can tell or uh, know if you're an emotional Christian. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for those who listen in. We pray as they listen in that they were encouraged, they were edified, and that they were enlightened. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.